Good morning. You can join me in opening your Bibles to the letter of 1 Peter. And if you don't have a Bible, you can find one under the chairs nearby you. And our text is on page 1014 in those Bibles. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to many of you who uh, were praying for me and my family this past uh, week or so. Uh, many of you know that my father uh, passed away in the last couple weeks. And so I'm grateful that I was able to be with him and my family um, as he passed, and I know many of you understand um, this kind of grief as you've gone through it yourself. So I'm grateful for your prayers. Um, also, as we turn our attention to First Peter, um, if you weren't able to get one of the scripture journals uh, on First Peter, uh, those are available at the Resource Center. So those are available to you to be able to use for this sermon series. So the scripture text is on one side, and a blank sheet is on the other side, so that you can take notes, study ahead. Uh, make reflections before the sermon. You can write sermon notes there. You can use that to memorize Scripture. Uh, so those are available to you for at no cost, um, assuming that you want to actually use it. Uh, so please do uh, grab those. We have plenty of them back there, and if we run out, we can get more. Let's read First Peter chapter one, verses nine through or six through nine. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary. You've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Our Father, as we spend time now considering this text that we just read, we pray that you would help us in the ways that only you can. We recognize that your word is true, your word is good, and your word is powerful. So we pray that your spirit would take your word and give us understanding to know truth transform our hearts so that we would respond rightly and feel rightly. We pray that you would deepen this love and joy and trust that this text talks about. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our uh, society is searching for happiness. Many live in a perpetual state of grief and sadness Depression and anxiety rates are incredibly high, unprecedented at this point. Behind the happy social media posts, many people are living in a steady state of sadness. And we're seeing many people in this state searching for joy. A number of colleges have recently launched courses and even degrees in the topic of happiness. Yale's happiness course became their most popular class in 300 years. And these are so popular because many people don't know how to find joy. Some people are wondering if our culture-wide sadness is tied to our increasing secularism. They're wondering if Christianity, as it's gone, has a deep kind of joy gone with it. Elon Musk just wrote and posted a poem on X last week that expressed this. Here's how his poem goes. And this is um, significant because this expresses something of what many people who have formerly been atheists or agnostics are feeling right now. He said, atheism left an empty space. Secular religion took its place, but left the people in despair. Childless hedonism sans care. Maybe religion's not so bad to keep you from being sad. There are a surprising number of atheists and agnostics that are asking the question and wondering if perhaps Jesus and his message were an irreplaceable force for good in our world. So here's our question. What does Jesus have to offer a sad world? At the very heart of Jesus' message is the answer to our sorrows. He came proclaiming what he referred to as the gospel, which means good news or glad tidings. It's news that brings joy. So Christianity at its heart, according to Jesus, is a message 
that makes people happy. It is a message of glad news. So the gospel invites us in our sins and in our sorrows to come to Jesus to find true joy. And what's unique about the Christian message that we'll see this morning is that it doesn't just give joy, in fact, it doesn't give right now joy that replaces sorrow. It gives joy that goes deeper than sorrow. It teaches us how to live with both grief and gladness at the same time. So Peter's writing to people whose lives have actually gotten harder, not easier, since they became Christians. They had enough trials living through this life like we all do, but then they became Christians and they got more trials. It got harder. And they're facing more reasons then for sorrow, not less. But Peter shows them how knowing Jesus gives a deeper joy in the midst of their even multiplying grief. So our text this morning is about how Christians can live with this powerful mingling of deep joy in the midst of sorrow. And the answer is found in grasping four insights about trials. So there are four insights about our trials in life that we need to grasp, and as we do, we'll learn to live with joy that mingles with sorrow. So the first insight is this. Our trials are part of a bigger story. So our text this morning is in the midst of a longer section here, and the focus of this longer section from verses 3 to 12 is praise. Peter's praising God for every Christian uh, and for giving every Christian what he calls a living hope. So he's referring to the future completion of our salvation. So you get really confused reading the New Testament if you think of salvation merely as a past reality that we kind of get at one moment and then we're on to something else. Salvation is an already and not yet reality. There's, there's a past aspect, a present aspect, and a future aspect. It's one salvation, and we're living in the midst of it historically, waiting for its completion at the return of Jesus. And so Peter is drawing attention to this future com- completion of our salvation This is when Jesus returns and we inherit the new creation with him. And so now Peter turns to say that Christians rejoice in that future completion of salvation when we inherit the creation with the Lord Jesus. And he says that we can rejoice even in the midst of grief and trials, and we can do this because of this insight. Our trials are part of a bigger story. This is verse 6. Notice it with me. In this And this refers to this consummation and completion of salvation. In this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So notice, first of all, that he's giving a straightforward acknowledgement of the reality of our grief. He does not say that you rejoice instead of your trials, instead of grieving your trials. No, he says we rejoice even though we've been grieved. The grief is mental and emotional. It's a kind of sorrow and distress that comes from our suffering. So Christians should not ever think or say that we should be happy instead of being sad. That's not at all real Christianity. Real Christianity is not happiness instead of sadness. It's happiness in the midst of sadness. Yes, one day when the new creation comes... God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and sins and sorrows and weeping will be no more. But that's not where we are right now. Until that day, we have joy in the midst of sorrows. What are the trials that grieve us? Well, he says there's various trials. Those believers he's writing to were living in the Roman world where Christianity was viewed with suspicion as people heard of it. It was a pluralistic society, but Christianity was the one religion that was most rejected as people came across it. And as Christianity spread and grew, hostility in response grew with it. Peter's writing to Christians at the early stages of cultural hostility, and there's more on the horizon for them. I know it can feel like this to many Christians in the West today. We're in a post-Christian culture, and so Christianity is increasingly viewed with suspicion, misunderstanding, disdain. Here's a few examples of the various trials that these first Christians were facing. So we can see them throughout the letter. Notice, if you just look ahead to chapter 2 and verse 12, people were speaking against Christians as evildoers. They were claiming that they were morally backward. 
We're experiencing that today in the cultural discourse, especially among the elites. In chapter 2, verse 19, we see that these Christians are enduring sorrows and suffering unjustly. In chapter 3, verse 9, people are reviling them. Chapter 3, verse 16, they're being slandered and their good behavior is being reviled. Even the good they do is getting mocked. In chapter 4, verse 12, Peter calls the whole ordeal a fiery trial that's coming upon them. So all of those trials were added to the griefs and trials they already had as human beings living in a fallen world. These believers were now facing social alienation. They were probably cut off from some vocational opportunities. They were probably cut off from some economic opportunities. They were on the outside, and in coming years, the hostility against them would turn violent. As they identify with Jesus, they find themselves at odds with the culture. But Peter slips in here that these trials are for a little while. Did you notice that? What does he mean? Does he mean that they're facing what he perceives as maybe like a two-year period where they're going to have trials, but then they'll go away? No, he's describing their new permanent situation in the culture. But he calls it a little while because he's reminding them that it's part of a bigger story. Our lives last a short while compared to eternity. And so Peter's saying, compare your temporary suffering to your eternal joy. That's comparing a penny to trillions. It's comparing a drop to oceans. It's a twig to the rainforest. It's a grain of sand to the Sahara. Do you know how many grains of sand there are in the Sahara? You can find out through estimation. 1.504 septillion grains. Our suffering, in view of the eternal joys to come, our suffering is one grain of sand to all of that. And actually, not really, because our future joy goes on forever. It goes beyond 1.504 septillion years. And so he can say in the midst of our griefs that we rejoice. We rejoice because we have a greater future coming, and we actually believe it because it's really true. The resurrection of Jesus in real space and time history shows that he's the king, and his word's reliable, and he said that his resurrection is the beginning. There's more coming. All who trust him will be raised to live forever as the whole creation's resurrected. So we rejoice because our trials are temporary and anticipatory of something greater that will last forever. And think about how this works, the nature of how we get joy from this hope. This is the nature of hope. When we hope for something in the future, we experience some of that joy even now. Think of something that you have been looking forward to in the past. Maybe it's a trip or some promotion or a vacation, and anticipating that very reality brings you joy even in the present, though you're not experiencing that yet, right? Hope is joy that trickles back into the present. So, Christian, if you are mainly, mainly experiencing grief in your life and you do not have this joy, then you need to get connected to the bigger story. You need to get perspective on the future hope. You need to have that hope in view so that coming joy can trickle back into your present experience even now. So that's the first insight about how to have joy in the midst of sorrow. We see that our trials are part of a bigger story. The second insight is this. Our trials prove and purify our faith. Peter says something pretty astonishing about trials here. He says that if necessary, we've been grieved by trials. So trials can sometimes apparently be necessary from a divine perspective. God brings or allows them to come into our lives, and He does it for a purpose, and that purpose is to prove and purify our faith. This is verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. So he is saying that they have been grieved by various trials for a purpose, and it's so that their faith can be tested and proved and purified. So trials prove our faith. They prove whether or not our faith is genuine. Faith can be false. You can profess to know Jesus 
and not actually know Him. Jesus Himself said so. Our trials then give opportunities for us to demonstrate that our faith is real and not fickle. It gives you an opportunity to show that you have the real thing. Jesus said that, (coughs) excuse me, His preaching is like delivering seeds that land on hearts like different grounds, different kinds of soil. And He said that when some people hear His Word, they believe in some sense at first, but it's like a seed that falls to ground that's covered with thorns. The seed sprouts up joyfully at first, but then the trials and the cares of this world and suffering comes, and they grow up, and they choke out that developed faith or that developed grasp of Jesus. It doesn't endure. It proves that the ground was not the right kind of ground. The faith was not genuine. So, trials prove our faith because they show if the faith endures and grows, they show it's the real thing. We have ground that was receptive for the Word. We have a heart that was receptive for the Word. But trials not only prove our faith, they purify our faith, and that's probably in view with Peter's comparison of faith to gold here. Gold goes through fire and gets rid of impurities. It becomes more pure, and our faith is tested in trials, and then it gets stronger. So, suffering is not pointless. God brings it into your life, or He allows it to come into your life with purpose to prove and purify your faith. And He does it not because He doesn't love you, but because He does love you. He views your faith as precious. Peter says more precious than gold. So as your faith grows through trials, it becomes more valuable than the amount of any wealth you've ever had or could have. The believer in Jesus who holds fast in trial. The believer has a kind of faith then that even if they only have a dollar to their name, they have something more valuable than the net worth of the world's richest person or all the wealth in the world combined because there's sincere trust in Jesus. So you can have joy in your sufferings because you can know that your sufferings Prove and purify your faith. But that's not their only purpose. There's a purpose beyond this, and this is where Peter's going next. The third insight is this. Our trials will give way to praise from God. Let's read the whole of verse 7 again. He says, We're grieved by various trials so that, here's the purpose, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, so that that tested genuineness of faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, he's saying we can rejoice through grief because our trials will give way to praise from God. Now, you may have thought I said that wrong. Shouldn't we say that our trials will ultimately give way to praise for God or praise of God, praise to God, not praise from God, right? Well, this is a great example of one of the challenges we have when we read and interpret the Bible. We don't always realize it, but we can sometimes force our own categories onto the Bible. So we come to a text, and we start filing that text into the categories we already have. We read a verse, we say, oh, that reminds me of this verse. That reminds me of this. Oh, I love this verse because it reminds me of this. And we're not actually paying attention to what the text actually says. We're actually reading it through a lens that we already have. Maybe a lens that we got from other parts of the Bible, which it's good. The Bible shapes our lens. But we can not realize that perhaps this text is giving us a new shade. This text is giving us a new category. And so we don't always have the humility or we don't take the time to pause and ask, what is actually being said here? What does it mean? Maybe I don't understand it right away. So we need to be prepared to let the Bible give us new categories. And I think this is one of those texts that's supposed to give a new category for us. Some of you no doubt have this, but I think this is a category that many are missing. It's an incredible one. The category this text gives us is this. One day, God is going to praise and honor His people. Now, that means our faith, as it's proven genuine and purified, it will result in praise and glory and honor from God at Jesus' coming. 
Now, the category you probably already have is this. When Jesus returns, He gets glory. We praise Him, and that's true, and that's biblical, and that's primary. But that's almost certainly not what Peter is saying here. He's saying that your purified faith will result in glory, praise, and honor from God. It's the tested genuineness of your faith, he says, that's precious and results in honor. This is an underappreciated doctrine among Christians, but it's not underappreciated in the Bible. It's actually fairly common, but we may miss it. Here's a few examples. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Apostle Paul says, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Sounds similar to what Peter's saying, right? The revelation of Jesus comes and our faith will be shown to be genuine and, and be purified. So Paul's saying something similar here. The purposes of the heart are disclosed. And listen to what he says. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Paul assumes that every Christian, of course, is a believer and has faith, but that every Christian has faith that's genuine and will have something in it that produces something in their life that's commendable so that at the coming of Jesus, all his people will be there and they'll be commended. Romans 2, verses 6 and 7 speaks of the return of Christ and the judgment as well. And he not only says that believers will receive glory and honor, he says that we should seek it. He actually kind of defines a Christian as someone who seeks glory and honor from God. We should long for this. So he says this, He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Then in Romans 2 verse 29, he refers to people who are born again and have received the new heart. They've been converted. They've come to faith. They've been transformed by the Spirit. And then he says this, a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And here's the reason I'm reading it. He says this, his praise is not from man, but from God. So one who has a transformed heart is seeking praise from God, not other people anymore. Jesus himself reveals a bit of what this will be like. He describes how different Christians serve him in their lives. He describes the coming judgment like a master coming to commend a servant. And he says in Matthew 25, 21, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. He commends his people who serve him. It's one of the most dignifying doctrines in the Bible. It means that what you do matters to God. What you do in your everyday life, in your vocation, how you treat your neighbors, how you treat your family when no one's looking, what you do even when no one's looking at all, what you do in your everyday life matters. God sees it and He will commend the evidence of faith in your life. Your faith is precious to Him, so precious that He tests it and proves it and will honor you for it. Just a couple days ago, I finished reading Lord of the Rings again, and there's a great moment toward the end. The whole mission has finally been accomplished. Frodo and Sam have carried the ring to its destruction, and in destroying the ring, they overthrew the reign of the evil ruler Sauron. They saved Middle-earth. And through this long journey, Aragorn, who's been with them in this journey and in protecting them and in having his own missions, he's now been restored to his rightful place as the king. And there's a ceremony where Aragorn is finally crowned, coronated. And after he's crowned, he sits on his judgment seat. And various people are brought before him so that he can pronounce judgments. And in the midst of the description of what this looks like, Tolkien writes, And there were brought before him many to receive his praise and reward for their valor. So here's the king, worthy of all glory and honor, rightfully praised, crowned, taking his judgment seat. And what does that king do? He brings people before him to praise them for their valor. Jesus will likewise enter his glory 
and his people will be brought before him, and he will praise and reward and honor them for their faith and faithfulness. Maybe this still seems unnatural to you, but think about how there is nothing more natural than a child wanting his or her parents' praise. C.S. Lewis pointed this out in The Weight of Glory. He said, nothing is so obvious in a child, not in a conceited child, but in a good child, as its great and undisguised pleasure in being praised. He's saying it is not arrogant children that want praise. It is even a good child, and it is a good aspect of that child to delight in being praised. If you're a parent, you give your child praise without begrudging it. You give it freely. You give it naturally. You give it joyfully, and your child loves it. When he scores a goal or when she scores a goal, they look to see if you're watching and to see if you're smiling and proud of them. And what do you think? Do you think, you know, I was going to, but because they were looking at me for it, you know, how arrogant, you know, just looking to be praised, you know, is that all they do it for? No. Humble children love to be praised and humble parents give praise freely. Now, we still may have a hard time embracing this. This is because we rightly know that God alone deserves all ultimate glory, praise, and honor. So how does praise from God fit with praise for God? Well, it fits like this. It is part of God's glory that He gives praise so freely. The honor He gives us will ultimately roll up to His own honor. Think about it. Peter said... We saw last week that God is the one who causes His people to be born again. So, God creates faith in us. Paul says that elsewhere as well, that faith itself is a gift. And then, God is the one we saw who guards us through faith. He perseveres our faith to the end. And then, any goodness that comes from us and from that faith is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the Spirit's work in us. So we really get no ultimate credit for the good we do. When God honors us, it'll be somewhat awkward in a sense because God is praising us for the very things He has produced in us. But this is also how it results in His glory because He honors us and we say, all glory goes back to you. You did this through me. And then we honor Him for even being so lavish that He would honor us. So history is going to culminate in a moment when God is glorified through the glorifying of His people. Of course, there is a real caution here. We live in a culture where people love praise and are self-indulgent. So the key problem is this. It's when we focus on our greatness rather than the other person's pleasure. So yes, it is prideful, to hear all of this, and if you get your pleasure from a thought like this, it's prideful. If you think, yes, God is going to honor me because I am so amazing. (laughs) But it is not prideful to think, I can't believe I have the privilege of bringing pleasure to God. What a great God He is who would honor me for the very things He enables me to do. The difference between two kinds of responses there is the difference between two kinds of Olympians we saw a couple months ago, right? One kind would maybe get a gold medal, go hug family, and there's some story about, you know, wanting their grandparent or their parent to be there to see it. And they're in joyful tears because they brought that aging grandparent such joy. And that joy is in part because Their grandparents proud of them, but they're so grateful that they could bring that pleasure, and they they would give credit to others. There's a difference between that and the other kind of person who you can see that the joy they have is basically because they think that they really are amazing. So let's return to Peter's main point. So what do we do with all of this? Why does this matter, especially when we're talking about joy and sorrow? Well, here's how you can have joy mingled in your pain as a Christian. You can know that your suffering, your various trials are here for a purpose, 
And that purpose is to strengthen your faith and trust in such a way that it results in praise, glory, and honor. And this is particularly encouraging to Christians who suffer in a hostile world. Because the nature of the suffering of Christians that Peter's writing to, the nature of it is public dishonor. When people make fun of you for being a Christian, when people view you as being a bigot, though you're not, when you have to lose an opportunity for career advancement, all of that is a diminishing of your honor. Yet even in the midst of it, you can rejoice because you know that a greater honor is coming. Some of you have taken social, economic, or career hits for being faithful to Jesus and maintaining integrity. You are rightly grieved by it, but you can know that that dishonor will give way to a greater honor, an honor from God himself, even for your faithfulness in that very dishonoring situation. That's a great joy. It's not the greatest joy, though. That's left for the final insight. Our trials cannot take our greatest joy. And our greatest joy is Jesus himself. It's the nature of trials and suffering to remove joy, to remove something that you love. Suffering is the removal of something that makes you happy. That's its nature. But Peter wants us to see that if you're a Christian, then you have Jesus, and Jesus is your greatest joy, and no trial, no suffering can take him away. So through your grief, you get to maintain your greatest and deepest joy in Jesus. That's the point of verses 8 and 9. Notice with me, he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So Peter is giving three dispositions of the heart that are the mark of true Christians as they wait for this completion of their salvation. Salvation of your souls, uh, it just means salvation of your life, yourself. It's the completion of our salvation that's coming for every single Christian. And he says that as we wait for that completion, we have these dispositions in the heart, even through trial. The first is love. We love Jesus even though we haven't seen him. Peter saw Jesus. Peter knew Jesus as a friend. But these Christians he's writing to never saw him. They found the resurrection of Jesus, the testimony of that, credible, historically credible, but they've not actually seen Jesus in person. We're the same. We've not seen him, and yet we are convinced with reasonableness that he really did live and die and rise, and he did this for us and for our salvation. And so we've been forgiven of our sins, we've been restored to him, and we love him. An essential mark of a true Christian is love. If you do not love Jesus, you don't actually trust him no matter what you say. It is in the nature of true faith to immediately, instantly produce affection for Jesus. Second, we believe in him, though we don't see him. Jesus wasn't against people believing because they saw him and his miracles, but he acknowledged that many would they one day believe in him without seeing, and that's us. He said in John chapter 20, 29, blessed are those who do not see and believe. Third, we rejoice with joy that's inexpressible. This is the joy that comes from being forgiven of our sins, being restored to God, and being eternally safe in Him. We were made to know God. We get an anchor of this joy in our, um, in our hearts as we trust in Jesus. And think about your deepest friendships, or think about relationships There's an echo of this joy in those. Our culture sings about the deep joy of romance, but all of this is a faint echo of the joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. It's what we were made for. In fact, Martin Luther said on several occasions, he was explaining why God actually withholds some of the revelation of himself to us. Someone asked him, why doesn't God reveal himself to us completely? And he answered, if one could believe it all, he would be so overcome with joy that he couldn't eat or do anything. God wants to save mankind from that so that the church will not collapse. He said, 
that if we could believe all that God reveals, that we would explode with joy. So love, belief, and joy, these show that Christianity is a religion of the heart. It is more than that. It is a religion of the mind and the will and action, but it is not less than that. It is from the heart. And this is because of who Jesus is and what it means to be saved. Jesus is the radiance of the glory and beauty of God, and we were made to know Him. And so, as we experience trials and sadness, because the things that we love are removed from us in measure, or maybe we lose hope that we'll have something we wish we could have, but it's not coming, we can always know that the Christian has one thing that's better than everything else, and it's the one thing that can never be removed. Though we don't see Him, we love Him, and we rejoice in Him. And this is also why we long for His second coming, or why if you don't have a strong longing, you should seek to cultivate that longing, not only for us to receive glory, honor, and praise, bringing pleasure to Him, but we long for Jesus to be revealed because we love Him, because He's the truly glorious one. And Peter, notice he doesn't say just that Jesus will come. Will come. You notice the way he said it? He said that He will be revealed. That's what we want most. We want Jesus to be revealed to us and to come. So this is the unique kind of joy that Jesus brings into the world. It's the kind of joy that can strengthen Christians who feel on the outside of their culture. It's the joy that Elon is looking for in his poem, even if he doesn't yet know where to find it. It's not a joy that removes our sorrows yet. It's a joy that comes in and under them. It's a joy that's greater than our sorrow. And this is the kind of joy that we as Christians can offer others in our culture. Our world is getting sad and tired and angry. Many people are exhausted. And what they need from Christians is a vision of a better way, the true way to be human. They need to see in you, your coworkers need to see this in you, your neighbors need to see this in you, your unbelieving family members need to see this in you. They need to see in you a steady, stable, resilient joy, especially when hard things knock you over in life. They need to see a joy that's in the midst of sorrow, not a superficial joy that pretends sorrow doesn't exist. They need to see a real joy that comes alongside and in the midst of sorrow. And they need to see this even as they see the culture shifting away from Christian values. They need to see Christians respond with a non-anxious posture. They need to see Christians not just grieve any hardships, but remain upheld by a stronger joy. Certainly this doesn't mean that Christians should not care about good values being upheld in our culture for the love of our neighbor. That's one thing Christians must do as well. But what we also must do is show a joy in the midst of grief, because we have a joy that comes from knowing Jesus, and no trial can remove Him from us. And maybe some of you are not Christians yet, and you feel this longing in your heart for a deep and lasting joy. This morning, I invite you to come to the source of joy. Jesus Himself made you for this joy. You won't find it in anything He made. you only find it in Him. So, I invite you to come. And trust Him, repent of your sins, and find joy. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for giving us clarity and insight into the hardest parts of life. We thank You that You give us a kind of strong, deep, resilient joy in the midst of sorrow. We pray that you would strengthen our faith. We thank you that you view our faith, the very faith you give, you view it as precious, more precious than gold or any amount of wealth. We thank you for loving us enough to even care for us through trial to strengthen our faith. And what a wonder that you, through the Lord Jesus, would praise, honor, and glorify us for the very good things you create in us. So we pray that you would make us a church that is, in the midst of sorrow, deeply happy. In Jesus' name.
Amen.